Hey, what's up, Hop Hog High School? I am here today with uh, the crew of Wellness Wednesday lunches. Really have appreciated the conversations that we've had as a group uh, in terms of our conversations together and what it's meant for the people on the call. And I hope that there have been a few people out there who have benefited from, or at least a few people who have benefited from the conversations as well. We've uh, This is our sixth Wellness Wednesday. I've, we've uh, really appreciate the opportunity coming together in this way. And we've been brainstorming some ways that we can continue to do this, even in the world beyond COVID-19 and uh, the impact that it has on our ability to be with one another. So uh, that's the foundation of what we got going on today. From a date perspective, today is uh, Wednesday, June 10th. Uh, we will, just looking ahead to next week, we'll likely do a Thoughtful Thursday on June 18th, uh, but that's for you to kind of sit tight and hold steady about. I know people are waiting for this video, uh, you know, on, on the edge of their seat. So um, just know that next week is the deal. Uh, without further ado, though, um, I want to talk, just point you to an SEL uh, uh, playlist that we have so you can find the, the Hot Pog High School SEL playlist. Um, I think my son wants to be involved in this conversation today, so we're going to move quickly, and then uh, and then and then we'll add some content to that as well. Um, and without further ado, again, James, welcome to the show. Always good to have you, uh, and take it away. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Uh, good to be with you all again, Hop Hog community for Wellness Wednesday number six. Um, today, I'm just going to walk us through a few slides around concepts and content, and then as usual, just offer um, some practices around mindfulness, emotional intelligence, and some self-care. So this week, as we, um, as we pull up the slides here, we're focusing on self-management, kind of emotional regulation through self-compassion, and particularly around the self-management of the kind of voice in our head, the triggers that come up internally as opposed to externally from something someone else says or from the news. This is more what kind of bubbles up internally from us. So we can see on this next slide, again, we ground basically everything we've done for these last six weeks and the next two really in this quote. So I'm just gonna pause for a second, give viewers a chance to read it. So between stimulus and response, there is a space. So between receiving something and this week we're focused on internally, I just had a thought, I just had an emotion and reacting, there is this space that we speak about. That's the mindfulness. That's the cultivation of a little bit of time before we emotionally react and just respond a little more skillfully and wisely. That's the self-management kind of the power to choose our response. And we have a big last sentence there and that in that response lies our growth and freedom. Those are big words, freedom and growth. But I offer that's exactly how we kind of take care of ourselves and take care of others through these practices. So let's take a look at self-compassion. I'd like us to work with something real and rich. It's the best way to apply this to our lives. So I have an invitation here before I invite us around the practice, think about all that we have been managing these last few weeks and months. We have pandemics, we have social unrest, activi activism, and then the relationships being isolated in our homes, cut off from friends and extended family. Given all of that unique stress and pressure, where has that voice in your head perhaps been telling you you're not enough, you're falling short? Maybe that's I'm not being as productive as I feel I should be. Maybe I'm not being as patient with my child or my sibling or my mom and dad. Or maybe I feel I've not reached out to my friend where I feel that I should. All of these feelings are completely normal we all have this inner narrator, this critical voice in our head. And I'll say often saying things to ourselves 
that we would never say to another human being. So we want to focus kind of our wellness episode this week on managing that voice in our head. So let's look at the next slide. As a reminder, this whole experience has been about self-management, emotion regulation, and wellness. So we are not avoiding our emotions, denying or suppressing them, quite the opposite. We are elevating them to acknowledge the reality that they are there as much now probably in these times as they ever have been. So what is self-management? If we just do a quick click on the slide, what we're doing here is we are reducing literally harm to ourselves, emotional, and to others. Because that inner voice, it has impact on how we treat ourselves and then how we can treat others. And this is just developing some skills for how to navigate these challenges more skillfully. So let's take a look at some research on the next slide. So it's hard for me to have a conversation without referencing a book. So this week's book is from this researcher here, Dr. Kristen Neff out of the University of Texas at Austin. She um, literally wrote the book on self-compassion. It's titled Self-Compassion. And I will say just candidly as a fellow New Yorker, Long Islander, we're gritty, we're resilient, we're tough. So the first time I heard concepts around self-compassion, it sounded a little gooey and soft to me. However, diving into the research as an inquiry, um, about two decades worth of research, there is some compelling evidence around the impact and the benefit of self-compassion, meeting ourselves with some, some kindness. Um, let me just offer very simply here, the three components of self-compassion that Dr. Neff references in her research. The first is mindfulness, and that is this turning towards the pain, the suffering, the critical self-judgment from the voice in our head. Not suppressing it, but actually turning towards it and acknowledging it. The second is common humanity, which is to say we all deal with it. Every person you see face in a square on this screen, every person in your home deals with challenge, struggle at some point in their life, and there's a running voice in the head criticizing them about it. The last piece is what's particularly new, I find, in our culture is this idea of self-kindness, meeting ourselves just as we would meet a good friend. And it's kind of shifting that so that we are as kind, caring to ourselves as we are to other people, so that we can actually be kinder and caring to other people. So let's take a look at some practices, please. There's probably in reaction to this, I know certainly for myself, it's like, well, wait a minute, I'm gonna be self-compassionate around my judgment. Well, then I'm, I'm gonna be avoiding things I should focus on. I'm gonna be letting myself off the hook and being apathetic and not holding myself accountable. Maybe I'm not gonna be motivated to change. I'm just gonna say, okay, I messed up, meet myself with some kindness. Or even if I'm motivated, I might not have the energy or effort to change. I wanna honor that healthy critical skepticism, but then share at the end some research speaking exactly to these concerns. Um, before we do, let's take it out of the conceptual and go into the experiential. And I wanna just offer two dedicated practices. So next slide, please. Bringing back up maybe some area where you're feeling you're falling short or you've been overly self-judgmental, kind of holding that. And the first exercise I'll offer, two dedicated practices here. Next slide, please. And one more is this idea of, I will lead us through a three or four minute guided meditation. If that's not serving you, which is totally understandable, another mindful practice is journaling. So you can take that same, this is where I feel like I'm falling short. I've been impatient with my husband, my wife, my child, my friend, and just journal out those emotions, but do it as the slides prompt you to, to do, through the voice of, a mentor, a good friend, and what would they say to you 
about these places where you're telling yourself you're falling short? How would they build you up? If you choose this activity, I would say do it for about, set a timer for five minutes and just keep the pen moving. And you're writing again through the voice of someone who cares about you and, and knows about you and wants best for you and see what comes out of uh, the pen. But with that, I'll lead us through a very short um, guided meditation and then we'll turn it over to Miss Griffin. So this will just be a guiding around the steps of self-compassion. So if you please just find a comfortable posture, whatever that means to you, including shutting the camera off, laying down if you like, and you can lower your gaze, close your eyes or keep them open. And just kind of landing in the moment, maybe through physical sensation of feet on the floor. We're just connecting into your breathing or simply the sounds in the room. And as always, if the guiding isn't working for you, you can just return back to this anchor of intention, this anchor of home base. If you'd like to try the self-compassion, let's just move through the three steps. So bringing to mind that place where maybe you feel you're falling short. And just step one, mindfully turning towards it. And just acknowledging the reality. There's some pain here. There's some hurt, maybe even some suffering. I'm sleeping in too late. I'm making it harder on my parents or my children. I'm not pulling my weight. Then step two, importantly, remind ourselves common humanity. We are all dealing with challenges. Quite literally, globally, we are dealing with a pandemic, shelter in place, disruption to our jobs, to our schools, to our social connections. It is completely normal to experience this pain, this suffering, and you're not alone. And then finally, step three, we have to have some fun here, maybe new. Just bring a sense of kindness, of warmth to yourself. It could be as simply as saying to yourself, I'm here, I'm here for you, you're enough. You're more than just the one mistake or one part of you where you're critical. Choose any language that works for you. And then if you'd like to experiment, there's strong research around something as simple as physical touch. So I invite you to just bring a hand to your chest. It's completely optional, but just see if that changes your relationship with yourself. Just a gentle connection physically. And when you're ready, you can return your hand to your lap. And then if anything you brought up around the critical self-judgment voice in your head was a little intense, maybe just kind of making a fist with one hand and releasing, letting it go. Returning your awareness to your anchor of the breath or the sounds. And as we close, I'll ring a soft bell. When you no longer hear the bell, Raise your eyes, open, raise your gaze, open your eyes. And you can bring a little si silly wiggle to the body, helps kind of transition. And uh, I will turn it over to Miss Griffin.
And when I come back on, I'll, I'll share a little bit more about the research and conclude with an acceptance micro practice. Thanks as always for the time. Thank you, James. I think Mr. Cook is going to show us a little video now. Welcome back. Congratulations on finding the third clue. Thought I'd sanitize before this video. Also, I want to give a quick shout out to my friends at East Hartford High School, one of the schools I worked with, who's doing a great job with SEL. All right, so I want to talk in this video about awareness. We can't manage something if we're not aware of it. And so we need to think through a framework of becoming aware of our levels of stress. The one I like to use is the traffic lights example. So a green light would be I'm calm and I'm not feeling a stress response at all, I'm relaxed. Then we have a red light, which would mean we're having a full blown stress response. We're basically in a panic. We've, you know, we're, we're not settled at all. The yellow light doesn't mean floor it and hope I don't get a ticket. It means caution. Yellow would be somewhere in the middle between green and red. You're feeling a medium amount of stress. You haven't quite lost it yet. And the whole key to awareness is learning to better recognize your yellow. If you can recognize your yellow, you can always intervene and not end up in red. So the traffic lights are green, yellow, and red, as we know. You're going to have a worksheet after this video where I want you to take the time to really write down and consider how does a green light feel to you? What thoughts do you have in green light? As, as you know, we've talked about how our thoughts affect our emotions. What physical sensations do you have in green light? And then last but not least, what kinds of behaviors do you engage in in green, in green light? Then you're gonna do the same thing for yellow and the same thing for red. You really wanna get at least three for each. It's really critical that you become aware of these different lights so that you can become better at intervening in yellow. The other thing I want you to do is I want you to take this knowledge and help others. There's probably a lot of people out there that are struggling right now with stress and to be honest with you with loneliness due to isolation. So reach out to some family, friends, extended relatives and check in on them. Maybe give them some support and then eventually ask them if it's okay for you to teach them a stress management technique that you learned, maybe even teach them the traffic lights as well. And then I want you to write a reflection on how it went. This can be really powerful for them and for you because one of the best ways to learn something is to teach it. And also you're putting it to good use to serve others in a challenging time. How about let's engage with this on social media. Tweet at me your favorite stress management technique possibly use a GIF, and use the hashtag EQ in your PJs. I'll retweet anyone that I think is useful, clever, or creative. I look forward to seeing what you got. In summary, what I want you to do is, when it's yellow, intervene. You always wanna keep it green. Fill out the links below, do the activities. Please consider engaging with us on social media, and I'll see you in the next unit. Shannon, what do we do now? You want me to go right to the video? I'll cut that. I'll cut this part out. Sure. Thanks. No problem. Print, home tab, in. Things, especially right now, that are beyond our personal control. So this week, we want to focus on the importance of acceptance. There are so many things, especially right now, that are beyond our personal control. For many of us, this is a particularly uncomfortable feeling, 
and it can often consume our thoughts. This lack of control or circumstances that just don't feel fair or can't be changed are often things that make us feel sad, angry, and anxious, producing generally uncomfortable or negative emotions. Ruminating about these circumstances can cause us to lose sleep, feel constantly on edge, and can make it hard to move forward in life. Acceptance, on the other hand, can significantly change our mindset. It is the process of coming to terms with the reality in our lives. This can vary from something simple like wearing a mask out in public or poor grade on a test to larger issues like school not reopening or the death of a loved one. There are lots of situations in our lives that require us to learn to accept. And that process can be quick or take a long time to come to depending on the depth of the situation. But acceptance is vital to us being able to move forward in our lives in a way that helps us to experience the good. Acceptance doesn't always mean you are okay with or agree with a, a situation. It just means that you recognize it to be the reality you are living in and something you do not have the ability to change. This powerful tool shifts our mindset from one filled with negativity and harmful feelings to one more positive and productive. If we're using the concept of the traffic light, it makes it easy to think about identifying how we respond based on that concept. So green is when we're at our calmest. This tends to be when we're in the best control of our emotions. Red, on the other hand, would be when we are in a crisis or having a stress response. This tends to be when we are not in control of our emotions, but more likely when we feel very controlled by them. And yellow means caution. It's a great time to recognize that we are having a strong reaction, but there is still time to choose how we want to respond. It's important to learn to recognize how you feel in each of these stages. So much of what we have been discussing in our Wellness Wednesdays has been about learning to slow down our thoughts by utilizing breathing techniques. Those skills will once again come in handy in helping us with this latest challenge. So the next time you're feeling calm, and I use calm because it's usually the easiest of our emotions to regulate, take the time to notice how you feel. Meaning, what does it physically feel like when you are calm? What sensations exist within your body? And lastly, what behaviors or responses do you associate with this feeling of calm or peace? Now, try to do the same when you're in the yellow and red zones. Learning to identify these three things will again enable you to better understand yourself and your control in these emotional times. Lastly, connecting this awareness to acceptance is a natural progression. Once I can better understand my feelings, I'm more capable of controlling my reactions. Often, people respond without thought or respond as a way of gaining more control. Accepting and truly understanding what is at the root of your emotions provides us with the ability to consider how we want to handle circumstances. Try thinking about your response when you're in each of these modes of red, yellow, and green. Plan out your ideas and how you think you might want to handle or react, and then try to practice them. Prepare yourself for the next time you're in one of these emotional states. Once you feel better in control of yourself, then maybe try sharing this idea with those around you. The people closest to us can also be the people who trigger us. Sharing these methods and encouraging others to try them as well may produce more tranquility in your relationships and provide better understanding and tools for you to communicate more effectively. So again, taking the time to breathe and understand our feelings in each color category will help us to feel more in control of our emotions and better capable of responding to the circumstances. Good luck.
James and Shannon, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I know that I have so many questions going through my mind. Um, but Shannon, you bring up a really great point with the traffic light. And I guess the goal is for all of us to really be able to get to a space where we can recognize the feeling and name it and perhaps share with those around us, like, hey, I'm in yellow. Right now, is, is that the idea? Yeah, definitely. So I think we use this technique sometimes even with families and trying to help them, you know, especially I think anger is a emotion that we tend to react to. Um, and people sometimes have a difficult time finding that space like James was talking about earlier because we're so quick to want to, you know, get into it when we're in that place. And I think if people can take the opportunity to recognize that this is kind of how I'm feeling. I'm starting to get really angry. I may not be at my best and my, I may not have the ability to communicate really how I'm feeling if I'm just basing my reaction in anger. Taking that time to sort of slow down, maybe take a step back, take a five minute break, you know, reflect on how I'm feeling. It really gives us the ability to control how we move forward where one, you know, the first way may be in sort of an out of control way or just really not being able to communicate effectively how we're feeling, but now understanding that I'm angry, but I can convey that to you in a calmer way so we can really work through the problem. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, while you were speaking of, of that and actually being able to think about how it felt when you were in the calm phase versus the caution phase. Um, mm. I just received today, James, you'll be so proud, um, hardwiring happiness. And in the beginning of the book, it really talks about remembering those good feelings. Mm -hmm. So when you are approaching the yellow or the red, you can get to a place where you can go back and remember that green feeling or that feeling of calm. Mm. So cool, what a cool connection. Um, thank you, Shannon. Does anyone in the group have a question relating to um, Shannon's presentation uh, before we move into uh, things that James shared? And you'll need to turn on your screen or just jump in. Actually, Joy, it, it made me think of the conversation that we started before recording. Um, just like you said, having, having that memory to anchor into. And if you want to discuss that a little bit more, thinking of a calm, positive time. I like the concept of really recognizing what green looks like so we know our goal when we're getting into yellow or red. And Joy, you had just spoken about kind of being able to reach back into that at that time. Can you share a little more about that? Sha me or Shannon, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry, you Joy. Yeah, what, what you had shared from your first, if you could just get a little more into that. Uh, sure, I'll try, um, and I may uh, defer to you, James, um, in a minute. But so, when you're in a moment of stress, or uh, when your emotions are beginning to take over, or that negative narrative is going through your head, my understanding and belief is that if you can get to a place where you can recall a feel good moment mm -hmm. like for example a time when you are feeling stress free or you were feeling happy doesn't it should not be a fleeting feeling but one where you can take a step back and say hey i was really happy in that moment or uh when i'm sitting on the beach and my toes are in the sand i really feel relaxed and and in the middle of a stress moment to go back to that feeling in your head to know 
that's a good place for me to think about, right? And and maybe James, you could clarify more. Uh, happy to, and I think that's very clear. Thank you for sharing your experience. I'll point to the to the verb in the title of that book, hardwiring. So in your example, Joy, um, the sand on the foot in the beach, the view of you sitting outside right now, and just in that space, mindfully saying, this is an awesome moment. I'm calm, I'm in my happy place at the beach or in my backyard. The hard wiring is literally letting that wash all over you, meaning don't take that resourcing moment for granted. The book, demonstrates how this isn't just touchy-feely stuff. This can be hardwired into our brain so that in moments of yellow and even red with practice, those calmer moments are accessible. They're in the bank and they are, themselves are a self-management and a resilience tool to help us be less reactive emotionally and more responsible wisely. All of the stuff interconnects um, in the way that Miss Griffin and Miss Ferrara and Coach Rudy have all said. And I just have something to add, you know, also, you know, James, thank you. Um, I think it's about muscle memory, you know, what you talked about, right? So we talk about like, you know, the more we practice doing something, um, the better we get at it. And I think, you know, we forget that, you know, in, in happiness and in, in, in self-compassion in all the SEL, you know, um, skills, we, it's not a one-off kind of a situation and it can't be utilized only during those times of stress. It should be a continuous, you know, kind of a practice where we're giving us um, compassion on a regular basis so that we can recall that kind of a feeling during times of stress. And I think for a lot of people, myself included, like in the beginning when we're in, in that situation, when everything is calm, we're not processing that. And so the slowing down and think about where I am at this particular moment, how am I feeling right now? even though there's nothing else going on. And like you said, you know, James, having that feeling washed over us is super important so that we could recall that kind of a feeling during times of stress. And you're right, like any sounds, you know, um, you know, sense, you know, whatever, you know, smell that, you know, can dredge up some of that memory is super important. And it is, you know, research with the hippocampus, you know, being so involved and amygdala being so involved and, you know, changing our brain, you know, um, structure. So thanks. Thank you. Annie, anyway, I'm really happy that you brought up um, the sense of smell. Uh, I remember um, as a kid, you know, my mother baking bread at, with my grandmother in the kitchen. And that, se that scent of the fresh bread brought me to a comfortable place. Of course, eating the fresh bread but really to a comfortable place but my mother sharing very similar stories so yes so um even around the holidays with the smells in the kitchen could trigger some really great memories and that could be something um to practice as well um now james you mentioned about the narrative and i i would like to go back to that narrative because you know, I, I am a, a product of uh, the 70s and 80s where we had 8-track and cassette tapes. And uh, in some of my own therapeutic journey over the years, uh, I had one particular therapist who had spoken to me about being mindful of playing that negative tape over and over and over again in your head and you know flip the tape was an expression that we had in session um so with that narrative that that narration that we hear on a regular basis sometimes it could be positive where hey i'm doing some great things or sometimes it's that creeping I, i'm not enough i'm not doing enough can you give us some suggestions on how to flip the tape of the narrative, so to speak, whether uh, you're a student or, or an adult, um, particularly maybe a staff member going through right now, how do we remind ourselves that we really are enough? Happy to, and then I, I also see Miss Griffin had her hand. So I, I think I'm gonna answer just really quickly and then turn it over to Miss Griffin. 
Um, so I think we've already surfaced connecting into our resources, which was last week's episode on resilience and resourcing. So that's one way to do it um, as that narrative kicks in. The other is to kind of keep it kind of coherent for this week is the self-compassion. So I just want to say the steps again. So the first mindfulness, that's what Coach Rudy said. That's what Miss Griffin said. Name how you're feeling. That's the mindfulness. Even as your brain starts to go through those files on words, how am I feeling? Why am I feeling frustrated or not enough? You're connecting into a different part of your brain, going through the files of vocabulary, that's gonna mute that tape a little bit and even begin to flip that tape. The other way to flip that tape is to say, this is not just me. I'm not the only one eating a little bit more than maybe I should be during quarantine. I'm eating all day. And just remembering that's not just me. And then lastly, and this is the part, at least for me was the newest to be repetitive is meeting ourselves with self-kindness. So when that tape begins to play and it's beating us up, changing the tone of it and changing that voice so that it is more of how you would speak to a loved one, a little brother, a sister, a parent, a grandparent, and just changing the flavor of that tape is a way to kind of interrupt that more critical tone. Um, I think I want to leave it there. And Miss Griffin, thanks for being patient. I, I saw your hand earlier if you still want to make a point. <laughs> so uh, the point that I was going to make, and it kind of works out perfectly here, you know, when I hear the expression muscle memory, as I think a lot of people do, we think about exercise and we think about, mm -hmm. you know, athlete, athletics and stuff like that. And I think that for most people, they don't think about needing to do the same types of things when it comes to our brains and our self regulation of our emotions. And they're no different. So I love that the concept today has, has we've used that term, because when we look at the dedicated practice, or we talk about, you know, kind of taking the time to think through some of these things and plan for how we want to react. It's no different than going into the gym or going for a run and knowing that like, the more I do this, the more my muscles remember how it's supposed to feel and I get stronger each time. It's the same thing. It's just we don't tend to be a society that talks about this in terms of our emotions or our brain. So I love that all of this is kind of tying in together and hopefully will help people in knowing that they really can, you know, grow this side of their, you know, emotional well-being as much as you would your physical side. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm noticing that we are running short on time. So uh, if, if there is one final comment by anyone in the group, and then I'll turn it over to Chris. It, just unmute your microphone if you have a final comment or question. Okay, I'm going to lean in then. I just want to make one quick connection. Sorry for all the airtime. Just connecting what Miss Griffin just said and Dr. Hong said earlier um, around not waiting until you are triggered. So to extend the metaphor of the physical, you don't want to learn to hit a curveball when you're at the plate in the bottom of the ninth. You don't want to learn, I don't golf, but to use your driver when you're at the 18th hole. You don't want to learn to hit that high note when you're at the performance in front of everyone. So that point that Ms. Ha Dr. Hong made and Ms. Griffin made, I just think that is important around changing the culture of, I need to practice this stuff, just like I practice uh, the things I perform physically. Excellent, thank you, James. Chris, do you have- uh, Hey guys, I uh, we have a Lego attack situation going on. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, hold on. Um, we <laughs> hey, there's there's a space between thought and yeah, thought. Just let them know. Let them know early. No, I I think uh, it, it that does kind of connect. Like so much of this is is learned behavior over years and years and years and years. And I've been uh, 
been lucky in this space to kind of be doing a lot of reading and, and research and, and just learning in relation to a lot of work across psychological spaces and the narrative and how we speak to ourselves is at the core of it all. Um, and, and, and getting control of that and, and where does that come from and what is the origins of it is complex. So I would just deeply appreciate the chance to kind of have dialogue like this. It's, uh, it's unique. It's heavy. It's, it's also of a high intellectual level and, uh, just appreciate people leaning in and, and hopefully it, us having this conversation and being open with each other about, um, you know, the way that we've all processed lends to like just openness to have the conversation generally. Um, so thank you. And uh, James, if you want to take us home from here, we'll go, we'll go there. I, I think you might want me to go back to the slides. If I got that right, let me know. And, uh, and we'll get to the finish line. Yes, please. Um, wrapping us up in just a few minutes, the slide would be helpful. So just to connect to what you were saying, Mr. Cook, around the heaviness, the intellectual aspect, I also want to like name the learning process. Over these six weeks, we've kind of, let's say, thrown a lot at you. Um, so wait, is this connected, this overlaps? So I just wanted to give another plug for the, the playlist that that lives there and be a great thing for folks just to go through on their own. Can't kind of comprehend everything just from these you know, one snippets once a week. So that playlist is an excellent resource. Um, so with that plug, I'll just, if we could pull up the slides, it's fine if not. I, I was sitting here thinking I was presenting them. That's funny. All right, cool. Ah. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. You know, we almost nail this every week. Almost. There you go. You're queuing, you're queuing us up perfectly for the, the micro practice. Yeah. So this is just a return to the, the, the legitimate maybe hesitations around self-compassion of that's avoiding my emotions. It's letting me off the hook. So if we could just click the slide. In a deep research study around people who had been deceitful, lied to partners, family members, bombed a test, there were three groups in this study. One journaled around self-esteem, a movement from the 80s, kind of thinking about all the things that they are good at. One group journaled about self-compassion, which was turned to the lie they committed, the deceitful move they may have made or where they bombed a test. And then a third group did nothing. And across all four metrics, growth mindset, ability to make amends after a lie or deceit, motivation to change and effort to change, those who did the self-compassion journaling really faced where they had stumbled, um, scored much more highly. So this is just grounding in research that this is not just touchy-feely. This kind of helps you be a better, more effective, productive you for yourself and for others. So last bit of heady research, we'll close bringing it really succinct. And if all of that was just too much, the next time your son comes in with a Lego crisis and you're hosting a, a webinar in one breath, I breathe in, do my best, I breathe out, and let go of the rest. The next time you feel yourself in yellow, try that on one breath. Remember us, all our common humanity, and you show up better in that next moment. Um, with that, again, gratitude for being part of this incredible inspirational crew. And um, have a great week, Hot Pod community. I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Cook. You guys, thanks so much. Shannon, thank you. Joyce, Sh thank you. Christy, Colleen, Annie, uh, Joe. And uh, we had some other guests kind of watching from afar. So hopefully this work inspires uh, some other good work to happen in the district. Excited about what we got going on. Uh, thank you, everybody. Peace out. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. Have a good thank week. Bye-bye. Great stuff today, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Good to see Thanks you, Christy. James. Thanks Bye. so much, everyone.